Okay, so yesterday we started with the atomic instruction test and said, uh, okay, Mani, can you tell me why we need atomic instructions? So why wouldn't software work? Good. Good. So that is why we need some atomic instructions. Monica, is this, are these four different lines of code or is it single line of code? There are four different lines. But if we write them as atomic instructions, would you expect them to run as a single line of code? So this is the software variation of software realization of the instruction, which is an atomic instruction. We have to remember that it's a single instruction. We saw how to build a simple lock using test and set, where the main condition is to test and set the flag variable. If the earlier value was zero, so this will move out of the while loop and set the flag to one. Otherwise, if, if the value was already earlier one, test and set will return one and we'll keep on spin waiting. And then we saw the uh, three parameters related to evaluation of locking techniques, mutual exclusion, yes, because it's an atomic instruction, it allows mutual exclusion, but there's no fairness. And the performance is bad because it's been waiting. And then we, discussed, we started the discussion on compare and swap. Can someone come and write the lock implementation for this? Does the void lock? So again, you have to write a single uh, line of code, which is the while line. <coughs> no, anyone else wants to try? Fairly similar to the previous one. There's only one. Mu should be one and expected as. Yes. So that's effectively all you need to do in this. Just tell me what expected a mu has to be. A mu is one. That's correct. So again, we have to. Yeah, so that's exactly what we need to do. Compare swap, lock, flag, zero and one. If the earlier value was zero, we set the new value to one. And if the earlier value was zero, this will move out of the while loop. And we won't spin. We'll acquire the lock. Is that clear? Okay, so compare and swap as was the case with test and set, it provides mutual exclusion, but there's no fairness because it's a very similar uh, notion. There's no asynchronous. So how do we add fairness to it? The simplest way to add fairness is to add some ordering of the threads, of, of the way in which threads can get you to the frame. So we look at another such atomic function, fetch and add. So this is going to fetch the value at the address increment by one and return, the old, <coughs> and return the old value. So take three, four minutes, look at the structure and based on this atomic instruction, create a lock which is fair in nature. Create a locking mechanism which is fair in nature. So 
the hint is that we'll not be using a single variable like previously you're using only a variable called plant you'll use two variables which have to indicate which thread has the turn which which thread's turn is it to now require the lock Okay, another way. So we, I said that you, you can use two variables. One of the variable will be incremented during locking. The other variable will be incremented during you unlocking. And the next hint is you will want to ensure that these two variables, whenever these two variables are equal, then comes in some notion. So then that particular thread gets the uh, lock. You can consult with the neighbors also in case that can help it.
since both of these are not equal now, we go into this endless while loop. And this set T2 won't be able to acquire the lock till the time the turn variable is incremented. And when will that happen? When the thread T1 will unlock. So let's say now thread T1 gets back the context again. T2, so T1 will finish the critical segment, it will now call unlock. And now turn will be incremented by one. Now it is now locked. Instead of the lock, is ticket is two and turn is one. And now the other thread will be able to, thread two will be able to run because now the value of turn is equal to my turn. Make sense? Anyone has a doubt on this? Do you want me to walk over the example again or is it clear? Again? So initially you understand that both ticket and turn are zero. During the locking phase, we call it fetch an add on ticket. The ticket will be incremented by one because fetch an add increments the variable and it returns it returns the previous value of the variable. So this function fetch an add will return zero, but it will increment ticket by one. So now ticket becomes one, but my turn, which is returned, is zero. So what we're trying to ensure is that my turn, whenever my turn is equal to turn that particular thread gets uh, access to the lock. And what we're doing is, each time we unlock, we increment turn by one. So that is the notion of adding fairness to the to the whole scheme. So that we're able to ensure that each thread gets in order access to the to the critical thing. If it is one, turn is zero. This point of time. We'll check the while condition. While turn is not equal to my turn. My turn at this point of time was zero. For this thread, for thread T1, my turn is equal to turn. So this thread will get the access to the lock. Which means that the first thread, which tries to access the lock, will always hit the lock. So that's also an important condition, which should, should almost always hold to in good engineering theory. Now, if there is any other thread which wants to get hold of the lock, let's say T2 comes in at this point of time, and the state of the lock is taken as one, turn is zero. Now, if T2 wants to get access to the lock, First, increment the ticket by one, which now becomes two, and my turn is basically the value of ticket minus one. It comes in. So my turn will be now one, which means that this thread will be the, the second thread to execute, in, in starting from zero to nine. But it won't be able to execute till the time turn has become one. And turn will become one only when the thread one will unlock, and it will increase increment the value of turn. Thread T1 now finishes the critical section, thread T1 was brought in. It increments turn by one. So now it instead of the lock is taken two, turn one. And now when we look at we when so we are basically spinning in, in the in this while loop. So turn is equal to my turn for thread T2. So thread T2 can now go ahead. Does ticket lock evaluation have mutual exclusion? Yes, because it's again based on some atomic instructions. Does it allow fairness? Yes, because now whichever thread is now asking for it, asking for the critical section, gets an in order chance to execute the critical section. Performance still we are using spin weighting, which is considered bad. So we'll now look at something which can improve upon spin weighting. One simple idea to um, improve upon spin weighting is what some of us were discussing yesterday. It's to just yield. So yield is like a system call which says that I don't want to have access to the CPU now. So you just give up the CPU for that particular time you want to. This is using test and set. So it's basically the same condition, but instead of uh, uh, infinite while loop, you just yield at that point. Whenever you're not able to access the lock. Suppose you're using something like MLFQ here. So, so if you're using the something like MLFQ for scheduling these states. Yeah. So in that case, like does yield imply that I'll always remain in the highest priority, let's say, or I'll still uh, move on. Does yield imply? I don't know the definitive answer to this, but you you as you as such not use the time quantum, but that's how people could also use it to game, right? 
because people could then were, were issuing system requests for input output mm -hmm. and until unless you took up that particular amount of CPU. But the contending thought is that they have not used the CPU. So I don't know a definitive answer to this. Gives up the CPU instead of spinning and thread goes to the ready state. Instead of the running state, it goes to the ready state. And it's still inefficient because if you have thousands of threads, mm -hmm. now each of them will be giving up the CPU. And in round robin fashion, you'll still have a lot of context switch cost. So that's something which we want to still avoid. Okay, so we now we do have an idea which is can we use queues for fairness? So can we put threads into queues and access, so put something into the queue and then pop something from the queue in order to ensure that there is some amount of pain. And we're also trying to build upon the previous ideas. So we want to yield in some sense and we also want to use the idea of fairness which in some sense ticket lock introduced. So can we combine both of these ideas to have a more efficient locking mechanism? The the key principle is that we want to exert some control over which thread to run next. So this is required for the policy of fairness. And we're using a queue for it. We combine spin waiting plus yielding. Does this make sense or weren't we trying to uh, set aside spin waiting? Then we want to eliminate spin waiting. Why do you think we are still going to use spin waiting? So it's, yeah, that's pretty much the idea. So if you look at this notion, so we're trying to now use a queue. Do we also need some locking mechanism for the queue? Because we don't want multiple threads to pop out of the queue at the same time or insert into the queue at the same time, right? So we we'll need some other, uh, some other kind of thread control mechanism even for the particular queue data which is being used. So we have two system calls. Again, in Unix or in Linux, we can have different names, but the idea remains the same. So, park, which puts the thread to sleep. So, park is called within the thread, so you don't need to give the thread ID. The thread will itself go to sleep. And correspondingly, there has to be a wake up or unpark. And for unpark, we require the thread ID also, because the wake up can be performed from the main thread or from some other thread. This is the key mode that we use for when we're trying to use Q for fairness. Just glance over it for three, four minutes and then we'll discuss it. Just think about it. What is happening? Previously we were having only a single flag. This time we have two variables. There is a flag and a guard. So it's like putting a thread to sleep is same as context switching and putting something in the Is there any really difference between the context switch and putting something to sleep? So context switch can happen voluntarily and involuntarily. But this is more voluntarily based. Okay, let's go over the code. We have a guard variable. Does anyone have any idea what guard would be doing? For the queue, not for the queue. Not just for the queue. Guard is going to be a lock around setting up the flag as well as doing some queue operations, queue.r. And guard lock is is what kind of a lock? It's spin weights, so it's not yielding. Mm. Why do you think it's a good idea? Not not such a bad idea to use a spin lock here. Because we know it gives us updates and then also it will take a lot of time. Right, excellent. So the, so the previously why spin waiting was bad was the critical section of the user which the user has in the code 
would be very, very long. So the other threads will have to wait for, let's say, 500 instructions. But here we have that definite, definite amount of very small number of instructions for which they will be still waiting. So we only have, let's say, this if or an else. Maximum two, three instructions need to be executed. So it's not such a huge loss, even if the other threads have to spin with for this particular time. So we use two variables instead of one. In the ticket block, uh, you also saw that we require two variables. But here the second variable is slightly different. It's acting as a guard for the other variable, flag, and for the key. We use test and set, guard one and equal to one. This is effectively spin waiting for the guard block. And this is setting the main lock. So the main lock still remains the flag variable only. Whether, uh, whether this particular thread gets the lock or not is decided by the flag variable. Whereas guard is only looking at whether we can change the flag or not, or whether we can add something to the queue or not, or delete something from the queue or not. And don't worry, we'll go through some examples to understand this better. Okay, so the key idea is we acquire the guard lock, which means that we can modify the flag and the queue. So we firstly uh, get hold of the guard lock. If we get the guard lock, we see if the flag is set or not. If the flag is unset, which means that this particular thread can set the flag and acquire the lock. But if the flag is already equal to one, which means that some other thread holds a lock. By lock, I mean has a set flag. So in that case, this particular thread has to be put to sleep, right? Because it cannot execute at this point of time. We add it to the queue, and we get we give the corresponding thread ID also in return. Now, if when all of this is done, we unset the guard variable, which means that now some other thread can do the same operations. It can acquire the guard, and it can set or unset the flag, or it can add or delete from the queue. And then we call the park uh, system call, which so once we've added to the queue, and then we put this particular thread to sleep. And we just discussed that not a lot of time is wasted in spin waiting because there is only a handful of instructions which need to be executed. So in unlock, we do the same thing. We get rid of the guard variable. We get rid of the guard lock. There are two conditions now. If the queue is empty, we unset the flag because there is no now in thread. We can easily unset the flag to zero. But if the queue is not empty, then what do we need to do? We need to pop out the first element, basically D4, we unpack it, and that, and we unset the guard again. So the guard can again be used for the other flags. Does this seem easy? All right, let's walk through some examples. Let's say we have three threads, T1, T2, T3, and T1 is context switched. If I put the thread which is currently in action in bold, T1 is currently in action. T1 wants to now add two to get the lock. So it firstly looks at this sign, which is test and set guard equal to equal to one. Initially, both guard and flag were zero. So T1 will acquire the guard lock. Does everyone get that? T1 gets the guard lock. If T1 gets the guard lock, it now sees whether the flag was initially zero or not. Was the flag initially zero? Yes, so T1 can now set the flag. But at this point of time, T2 is context switched there. And it now tries to execute the critical section. And now you will appreciate why you require a guard block. So has T1 yet unset the guard block? No, right? Because it will unset it only after it has completed all these instructions. And T2 now tries to acquire the guard block. Will it get the guard block? No. No, right? because the guard is being held by thread T1. So T2 will only keep on spin waiting, but it doesn't need to spin wait a lot because T1 will eventually come back into action and very quickly complete. T2 spin waits. T1 is again switched, context switched back in. It now, it set the flag, flag was the main lock variable, and it then unsets the guard variable. So basically, guard is going to be set at the start of the lock and at the start of the unlock, 
and as soon as the main operation of either lock in, uh, lock in by locking, I mean that the flag is set to one, or the thread is added to the queue and we pass the thread, we uh, we will set the guard to zero after that. And correspondingly, in the lock in the lock also we'll do the same. But for now, let's look at the guard variable, which is now set to zero. Now thread T3 comes into action and it it looks at this first line. Can it now set the guard? Yes. Why? Because the guard was unset in thread T1. T2 would, T2 would also have set the guard variable, but T2 was not context specific. So T2 was just unlucky in this case. T3 gets the guard variable. T3 now tries to set the flag. But who holds the flag? This thread holds the flag. T1 holds the flag, right? So T1 set flag to 1. So we check here if flag is equal to equal to 0. It's not the case. So we enter into the else. Which will now add T3 to the queue. Makes sense? So T3 tried, T3 got the guard. T3 tried to set the flag, but it cannot set the flag because the flag is set by some other thread. So T3 will now add itself to the queue. But before we could do the other things like set the guard to 0 and park the thread which is put the thread to 3, T2 again wants to now execute. So T2 is always, you know, unlucky, it tries to get the guard at the wrong time. Now, has T3 unset the guard? No, no, right? T2 again tries to set the guard variable. Uh, again, out of luck, can't set the guard variable, keeps on spin waiting. Now, context switch back to T3. T3 will set the guard variable to zero because it's done with the queue operation. We require the guard variable only when we find to modify the flag or we find to modify the queue. We unset the guard variable and we park. So T3 is now put to sleep. T3 won't, now T3 won't be context switched in till it's unpark is called. Do you see the uh, importance of this? So we won't have to unnecessary context switch in T3 and it will have to spin wait. So all of this is avoided. Now T2 again is context switch then, but this time T2 is lucky because the guard variable was unset by T3. T2 again tries to set the guard variable using test and thread. It's able to acquire the guard lock, but the flag is still not equal to zero because the flag was still held by T1. So T2 also goes into the else where you add T2 to the queue. You unset the guard and you park. So T2 is also put to sleep, but before putting to sleep, T2 is added to the queue. And now the queue looks like T2 and T3, where T3 means the first in the first element which was introduced. Now T1 has executed the critical section. T2 is context switch back and can T2 be context switch back and? No. No, right? Why? It's not to sleep. Because it's put to sleep and until and unless it's unpacked by some other thread, it will sleep indefinitely in some sense. Now T1 completes the critical section and it proceeds to the unlock. So before unlocking, what will it do? Before unlocking, before accessing the flag, what will it do? What will it check for? The guards. The card variable, right? You could have seen from the other while I was trying to hide from T1. So it will check for the guard variable. So it checks for the guard variable each time it tries to access or modify the flag, or each time it tries to change anything with the queue. It tries to access the guard variable, it's able to set it because no other thread is currently holding the guard. Now the queue is not empty. So it is going to unpack the first thread from this particular uh, queue. In this case, the first thread to be unpacked is T3. It's, it unpacks it, sets the guard to zero. Now T3 can enter into the critical section because so it can T3 can get the flag.
That's right. In fact, this is one of those weird cases where you don't even need to unset the flag because T3 had already finished both this if and the else. It will now get hold of this until set. So, seems counterintuitive, right? Previously, we always used to get, we had to unset the flag to be able to acquire the lock. So, in this case, in some sense, it gets the lock even before getting the lock, before, even before setting the flag to be one. Because what it's saying is that this thread was holding the lock, and since this thread is giving the access control back to D3 or unpacking it, it starts off in the state with the uh, lock already there. Make sense? How confused? Okay, so now we look at something known as fake up waiting based condition. So this, this code is also not perfect. This code can also have some race condition. Can anyone, has anyone identified the race condition which can occur? Mm -hmm. Not here, it's somewhere else. Somewhere from line 15 to 19. Excellent. So, can you explain that? Like, so, uh, we were about to add it in the queue, but then the mother was not. Right. The mother was. So, the queue is already added. Between 17 and 18 years ago. Could you explain? Uh, I was trying to connect to the same video. Uh, so, uh, and we have not found the video. So, <coughs> It grows, but not exactly grows. I'll walk through the example. So it's between 17 and 18. So let's say T1 uh, acquires the guard of the flag and it unsets the guard at a time. T2 acquires the guard and it tries to add itself to the queues and it unsets the guard. Now, so at, at line 17, there is a context switch. So T2 is, has added itself to the queue. It's unset the guard, but the T2 has thread has not yet found. So T2 has not yet been put to sleep. Now T1 gets the control back again. It goes in the uh, it, it because the guard was unset. T2 mm -hmm. can now uh, enter into the unlock section. It sees if the queue is empty or not. You know the queue is not empty because T2 has been added to the queue. Mm -hmm. It now unpacks. So unpack will basically say that you know thread T2 has to be woken up. So thread T2 is woken up, but that doesn't do anything else. That does anything significant because thread 2 is still like woken up only. And now thread T2 gets back the context. It sets a bark. Okay. So now there is no corresponding unpark left because this particular thread has already been removed from the queue, and this particular unpark has been called. So this will now sleep indefinitely. What could be a solution to this? If you ask, if you do part before the guard, that is that good? Why is that bad? Guard will never because you have slept right. That's also a bad idea. And this is a <laughs> so there is a simple uh, workaround which they suggest that so you call a function set bar which says that you know I'm about to park. So that's what uh, some of these systems, Solaris does. Okay, so there are some other concepts left in this chapter which we'll hopefully study after some time if we have that time. Like two phase blocks. So even if we don't study in the OS code, don't worry, we'll definitely study these in the DDD.
debate against whoever needs to play it against it. But they're very fundamental in Qtex, which is used in Linux, and Priority in Ruby. And we still have a couple of minutes, so I'll finish this topic. So the next topic would be to use some log-based concurrent data structures. And these are the topics which are very frequently asked in systems company interviews. So you should definitely spend some time implementing these. The idea is to add logs to data structure to make it thread safe. So let's, and there are two important goals, correctness and Correctness means that you correct the data structure performs correctly and when you add you're able to add only a single one. The other one should be overhead should be low or performance. Should be high. Let's look at a simple non-threaded counter. So this counter has an init method which by now we should have now understood that thing. Every has everything has to have an init method. Increment increment by one, decrement decrement by one, get counter, uh, just returns a value. But is this thread set? No, right? The multiple threads are trying to access the increase or decrease or even access the value. It's not thread set because uh, each of them is not an atomic construction. Mm. One simple way to build a concurrent counter is to, so in the init condition, we add the initialization for the mutex. Mm. And in the increment, we lock and then we increment the values and unlock. So we follow this initialization, lock, modify, and lock. And we'll have the same thing in the uh, increment function and the get function. But this this concurrent counter works very poorly. Uh, there are many other examples in the book. There, there is another implementation suggested in the book, which says that for each code, uh, each code means each processor code, we have a local, uh, so we have one lock per code, and there, there is one global lock. So for each of the threads in that particular code, we increment the counter independently, and then we add them by setting and unsetting the global lock. So the disadvantage of such an approach is that it won't be, uh, so there'll be some lag in getting the correct value. But the advantage is that it's much more 